They're very much the canary in the coal mine. Their habitat is literally melting away. What we don't know is how polar bears are responding to climate change. Scientists want to understand where the bears are choosing to den when the sea ice is no longer available to them. They want to know how much extra energy they're having to expend in order to find prey or find a mate in this new changed environment. Polar bears are extremely difficult to study in the wild. They have huge home ranges. They live in a place that's dark the majority of the time. Uh, it's incredibly cold. It's just a very difficult place for people to do direct observations. And there's a number of scientists who have had questions about polar bears that they were hoping to answer using bears in zoos. Conrad and Tassel were born at the Riverbank Zoo in South Carolina, and they were there until they were about two years old, and they came here to the Oregon Zoo together. Conrad, in a nutshell, is a big goofball. He's a gentle giant. His sister, Tassel, has a lot more energy. In order to take the best possible care of polar bears in a zoo, we need to build strong relationships with them, and we need to ask them to cooperate in their own health care. So, that got us thinking about how can we get them more comfortable with being touched. It required us to get pretty creative. By bringing them out into a three-sided mesh box, we can actually move around the animal. It really gives you an opportunity to train more behaviors than you might otherwise be able to. In 2011, Tassel became the first polar bear to allow blood to be taken from her without being under anesthesia. As far as we know, that was the first time it's ever been done anywhere. Once we had that voluntary blood sample, it created a lot of opportunities for us to collaborate with researchers. In 2013, the U.S. Geological Survey approached us to ask if we could train Tassel to wear a collar that would house an accelerometer. By observing Tassel wearing this collar and videotaping her behavior, they were able to put together a digital library of all the behaviors that she's performing and what that signal looks like from the accelerometer. Now they can take data from collars on wild bears and actually be able to piece together their activities minute to minute. We also were approached by the U.S. Geological Survey to participate in a diet study. We were able to put our bears on a terrestrial diet for a few weeks and then switch them to a marine diet. All the while we were collecting blood and hair samples voluntarily from our bears. That's going to help researchers look at what a wild bear has been eating simply from a hair or a blood sample. I think these collaborations have really opened the scientists' eyes for what's possible and we're excited about some future collaborations. One of the things they've always wanted to know is what are the metabolic costs of swimming for a polar bear? There's larger and larger expanses of open water in the polar bear's environment. How is that affecting their ability to maintain weight and find food? We have a wave room here at the zoo that would convert beautifully into a metabolic swim chamber, a lot like an aquatic treadmill. Scientists would be able to collect the exhalations of the bear and do some calculations to look at the metabolic costs of swimming. The success of all of these collaborations really boils down to the bears themselves and their remarkable abilities, the animal keepers and the relationships they've been able to establish, the zoo foundation identifying donors to help us with the right kind of equipment, the community that's obviously supportive of our conservation research efforts. It's all been a way to really connect the zoo and the wild in a way that I haven't seen before.